Welcome everyone to Columbia at Home. I'm Donna McPhee, a graduate of Columbia College of the class of 1989, and I'm so excited to welcome you tonight for, and for some of you, maybe different times of the day, some education and some entertainment. Personally, I'll be joining a, be enjoying a glass of a Cabernet Sauvignon from fellow college alum, Dan Petrowski. This is Band of Vintners. Um, so I'll be excited to join um, and have some wine as well as learn from three fellow alums today who are part of the Columbia Wine Industry Network. It will be an exciting program about wine appreciation. The panel will be led by my colleague Ken Catandella, a co-founder of the CAA Wine Industry Network. Near the end of the program, we'll have an audience Q&A. You can use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen to submit a question. We'll try to get to as many as we can in the time that we have, but there will be follow-up uh, after the program as well. I'm now pleased to welcome Ken Catandella to Columbia at Home. Everyone, please enjoy. Thank you, Donna. And thank you everybody for joining us and welcoming us into your homes and hopefully your wine glasses. Tonight, it is my distinct pleasure and privilege to moderate a conversation with three friends and Colombians. Uh, Greg Ahn is a graduate of the business school and is president of the Folktale Wine Group. Amy Chang is a graduate of the School of Architecture, Preservation, and Planning, and is a principal in her family's uh, vineyard, Nine Sons, and Nicole Rollet, and her husband, Xavier, who is a business school alum, are owners of Chen Bleu in the Rhone Valley, and a special thank you to Nicole for joining us in the dead of night. So with that, uh, I'd like to ask my panelists to join me. Great. Welcome, everyone. Um, and we're going to get right into it. First of all, thank you to the three of you. And one of the things that I like to start all of these off with is a question that we get a lot, which is, did you, were you always doing this or did you do something before this? So um, I want to start with um, Nicole. Before you got into the world of wine, um, how did you spend your days? Oh my goodness, Ken. I actually grew up as a diehard New Yorker. You know, one of those Park Avenue princesses and everyone on this call has spent at least some time in New York. But my mother was a journalist and a food critic. And my father loved wine. So I was practically raised in fancy restaurants and you know, hearing all that wine banter. But I never for a minute imagined that I'd be involved in actually making wine, let alone viticulture, right? The closest I got to that green stuff called you know, plants was Central Park. And for me, biodiversity was pigeons and squirrels. So uh, you, most unlikely person to end up making this kind of ooh-la-la, cutting edge wine and pioneering sustainable viticulture in a UNESCO biosphere reserve at the top of a mountain. When I was eight, my family moved to Italy and I went to Vassar. So my career was mainly in finance at Chemical Bank, Merrill Lynch. I worked for David Rockefeller at the Council of the Americans at Latin American Think Tank on Park Avenue. And then one fateful day, I met my amazing husband Xavier, very charming Frenchman at the wedding of our dear mutual friend and fellow Columbia graduate, Michel Brogard. And uh, he whisked me off my feet, whisked me off to Europe. And there he was pursuing his dream of having a vineyard because there were a lot of winemakers in his family. And he was working in finance at the time and had just found this hidden gem, sort of an me abandoned medieval priory lost in this little natural amphitheater at the heart of a wild forest. So uh, at first I was a bit of a fish out of water, but um, I you know, thought, okay, I can help you fix up the house and you can make the wine. But of course, fate is full of these ironies. And then my mother passed away suddenly from cancer. 
and it changed the yardstick with which I assessed what mattered in life. So it kind of brought into focus the importance of legacy. I wanted to do something that would have really made her proud. And it dawned, dawned on me that it was my destiny to take on this 1000 year old place and its historic vineyard and, and leave it better for the next guys. And hoping that if I gave it an, a new lease on life, I'd get one too. So uh, that's how my big wine adventure began. I started my full conversion and joined Xavier and his family on this enormous, scary, but exciting quest that changed my life. Great, thank you. Amy. Um, before I start this question, I just have to really give um, a huge thank you to all my friends and family who I know are tuning in tonight um, because I live in New York City and our winery and vineyard are in California. And I went back to school to study um, uh, wine business um, and get an MBA at Sonoma State and I commuted every single weekend for about a year and a half to to go back to school so it's really thanks to all of them that I'm here today. Um, I can't say that I always dreamed of working in wine but I did grow up in Lodi which is a wine producing region in California and as I started in architecture at UC Berkeley a lot of the social and environmental justice issues that we studied through design were really relatable having grown up at the intersection of agriculture and labor and sustainability. Um, it was really important for me to move um, from, you know, building on land with new resources to becoming a steward of land and farming. And also, um, you know, wine is one of the last few industries that cannot be fully mechanized. It still requires hand labor. And that for me is just a really vital part of creating and producing as a human being. Great. And last but not least, Greg. I don't know why I have to follow these people. Okay. Uh, uh, how did, let's see. I got into this business because my mother made me promise to never open a restaurant. Uh, she knew I had the bug and she owned a restaurant in Los Angeles uh, where I started learning about wine and was exposed to wine fell in love with wine and food and hospitality. So she made me promise never to do it, um, but uh, to open a restaurant. But so I bounced around and ended up uh, following a girl up to San Francisco and found myself in wine country and somehow uh, networked my way into getting a job at Seagram. And so I worked for 10 years in corporate wine uh, before um, they, kept relocating me to different wineries. And finally, when I ended up in Mar Monterey, I said, well, this is pretty much where I want to die. So I'll just stay here, started my own wine company. So that's kind of always been in wine a little bit. Thank you. Um, I thought after those three stories, it might be fun to let everybody uh, have a little show and tell and um, take a look at those places that you so love. And so I'm going to ask uh, Greg to start for us uh, and talk a little bit about, you know, what it is about Folktale that uh, really resonates with you. Yeah, the, uh, the thing that I fell in love with with this property, it was, it was an existing winery before I purchased it. Um, it was called Chateau Julien and was founded um, in the uh, early 80s. Um, by the time that I discovered it, it was um, a bit... Uh, it had suffered a lot of years and hadn't been kept up. And so there was this beautiful property that was a bit unkept. Um, uh, the thing that really attracted me to it was that while Monterey is a, is a, is a huge wine growing uh, county, this property was only five miles from the ocean where the next closest winery was another 45 minute drive away out in the uh, Salinas Valley. So this really allowed me to have a, uh, well, usually I don't love heat and usually where grapes grow well, it's hot. But here in Carmel, it's perfect for humans and luckily perfect for grapes, the kind of grapes that we grow at least. Um, so, and the proximity gives us access to all the peninsula and the tr tourism. Um, it removes us a little bit from the agricultural center of Monterey, but, um, uh, the property is is this like 15 acre little uh, slice of heaven in, in Carmel, uh, Carmel Valley. It also has uh, use permits that allow us to do events and weddings and 
entertainment and we have uh, concerts throughout the year uh, when there isn't a global pandemic going on. Um, so it, it just gives us a lot of opportunity to do, uh, create a lot of different experiences around wine. Um, so I did get my mother's permission though before I went into hospitality, but uh, now all holds are barred. So we're, we're going crazy. Okay. I have to say the thing I love most about Boattail is the energy. It is probably one of the funnest um, places to go and have a glass of wine uh, anywhere I've ever been. It's just, it's, it just oozes celebration. And I, I think it's something very special. Thanks, Jen. Um, now I'm going to move on to Amy. Okay. Um, so we have two businesses, Nine Cents Winery. And as I mentioned, we're also a grower. So with Ho Yi Vineyard, we continue to sell our fruit to other vintners making wine. Um, when you're a grower, you're a steward of the land. Um, and I just want to take a minute to acknowledge that we are occupying the land of the Wapo indigenous people of Northern California. Um, I think what I most love about our project is that we've become this quiet caretaker of a really special property. It's a 1400 foot elevation um, on Pritchard Hill in the Napa Valley. And we have all um, hillside vineyards. About half of our property is covered in a protected California sagebrush, which imparts you know, all the beautiful aromatics to our red wines. Um, our architecture, you can see it on screen, is uh, really unobtrusive. It reads like a dark incision in the landscape um, from the valley floor. And I think the quality of our vineyard really speaks for itself. We have a diversity of winemakers creating consistently notable 95 to 100 point Hoi Vineyard wines, you know, each in their own unique expression of our terroir. So that's, you know, kind of what Nine Sons is about. It's like sharing and celebrating the beautiful assets of this land with, with all of you. I, I have to say that yours is probably the most aesthetically beautiful winery that I've ever visited anywhere in the world. And, um, and incredibly functional as well. Um, and it's, it's, it's really an experience. And finally, uh, we're going to go across the pond to the Rhone and Nicole. So yes, this is a very particular enclave because we're right on the edge of a tectonic plate in the southern Rhone. So it's the bottom of Europe smashing into the top of Africa and putting the edge of the plate on the side. And we're totally isolated at the top of this mountain, what I call the fantastic four of our terroir with this uh, amazing altitude and idyllic isolation and uh, generous geology, very, very exciting geology. Uh, and marvelous mar microbiome. So uh, for us, it's so exciting and for, and for me personally to be plunged into the deep end of all this sustainability in this biosphere. I mean, just to give you an idea, we have 1,200 species just of butterflies. And um, of course, you know, it's a privilege to have wild boars as your co-workers. They, in fact, they actually sometimes have better manners than some of the people I used to work with on Wall Street. Uh, but just to, to be in that natural environment, it has constant, constant reminder that this, this place has been farmed for more than a thousand years and we're just temporary guardians that are gonna give it on to the next guys. So the other thing that I love, and I think a lot of people from Colombia can relate to this, is that you know we're very far off the beaten path, but it helps you really think outside the box and it becomes a sort of a wine lab, a place where you can have all sorts of different people experimenting with things, thinking about things. And they call me the connectress, but I see it as an opportunity to connect this place, not just with really exciting people, but we call it Planet Chen Bleu, it's sort of this culture of best of. It's you know medieval meets modern and local versus international and um, nature versus tech and sort of take tradition and vanguard, you know, all those contradictions, those juxtapositions that sort of make a fermentation of, of ideas. And I think that's just such a privilege. And when you get to go to a, a top academic institution where people from dis different disciplines will work together and exchange ideas, I wanted to recreate that a little bit. And, uh, and, and my husband loves that as well. And I think that was really a foundation of what we tried to do. The last thing I'd say is, Making wines in that sweet spot in the Venn diagram 
between stuff that tastes really great is really good for you without all the chemicals and the crap that they put these days and then finally that's also you know being good for the planet and being sensible and responsible and sustainable like finding that little spot that is the ultimate quest and and that is a, a hugely exciting challenge that we try to meet um well i have to say that the southern realm was where my wife and i went on our honeymoon and uh fell in love and um, be, between what you, and we were going to come and visit you in May, but alas, could not, but it is uh, one of the most beautiful wine regions in the world. And yours is one of the most beautiful properties within that beautiful region. With that, ladies and gentlemen, we're gonna have some fun now. So we promised you noble grapes. And so what we're gonna do is discuss in a little bit of detail um, six varietals, three whites and three reds. We're going to go from the, uh, li the lightest to the richest, and then we're going to go to reds and do the same thing. Um, but one of the things that we want to do is to demystify uh, all the wine stuff. So uh, I've asked my three friends to when they introduce their varietal uh, and start to talk about the character rather than talk about the character of the wine, they are going to uh, give us an actor or actress they think embodies the character of that varietal. Talk a little bit about uh, where in the world the varietal is. All of these are, are uh, all of these six that we will discuss are grown all over the world and are very different to ours in climate. And they'll, they'll give you a high level food pairing with each of these. So starting with our whites, uh, Nicole will begin with Riesling. Thank you so much, Ken. Um, so I guess I really came late to the party on Riesling. I love Riesling so much now, but it had such a bad rap uh, that you know it took me a while to come back around to it. And I would say if I had to talk about like Riesling in a very general way, because it comes in so many different styles. I'd say that overall, nowadays, it's a wine that's bursting with grace. I mean, it's such a respected grape for centuries, right? Maybe um, uh, the heartland, you know, there's a lot of controversy, but most people think that it's in the Rhine region in Germany. And they talk about the Moselle and the Rhine-Hessen amongst the most classic regions. But this bad rap really started to emerge in the 70s because some of you may even remember that sweet, flabby, sort of cheap Liebfrau Milch. But in the 80s, there was a handful of producers who set out to, wrong, to right that wrong and really show the world this incredibly complex, elegant wine that could be made. So, the thing that makes Riesling so interesting to me personally is that it's, it's got that incredible ability, so rare in the wine world, to combine this sort of lusciously sweet the, you know, deliciousness, but also tart and crisp and zingy at the same time. And then it has that searing minerality and like, wow, what a package. So I guess most people think of it as a sweet wine and it used to always be known as that, but there are more and more dry Rieslings. They even make sparkling ones. Um, it's planted in so many New World countries now. There's uh, also Alsace and Austria, if you like the drier styles. The warmer climate ones um, have a lot of apricot, but you know, if you smell apples in Riesling, in a wine, it's probably a Riesling. Like apples are one of the most characteristic smells. In cooler climates, you get a lot of citrus like lime and the aging capacity. I mean, absolutely so unusual that wine, that white wine can age as well as Riesling does. So I always associate age, ageability with quality because that the ability to, to, to hold its ground with all the oxidation and the things that can happen, uh, always a sign of quality in my book. So uh, it gets, it, that elegance, it has the complexity, and then as it ages, the famous smell of petrol 
gasoline, rubber. So if you ever get a little whiff of that, I have some right here, some petrol, that is a dead giveaway that it's a Riesling. Conversely though, there are some Rieslings that don't have that smell at all. So it doesn't always work the other way around. Um, the other thing that's really cool about it is that it's, it's sort of a single varietal, even when it's produced in the old world. So if you're starting on your wine journey, that's very comforting and makes it a little bit easier because most European wines tend to be a bit blended. Um, and the other thing that's really convenient about it is that it comes in this sort of thin pointy bottle. Now, of course you can always find exceptions, but generally if you see a long thin pointy bottle, you can be pretty sure that it's a Riesling, which also makes it convenient to get started uh, with. Um, food pairings, um, classic, German dishes, sausages with onions, you know, it cuts through all that grease. That acid is just great with big greasy dishes. But on the other, um, on the other end of the spectrum, if you have a dry one, uh, classically people have it with sushi. It's not very easy to pair wine with sushi. Riesling, Riesling, dry Riesling is a great choice. Uh, if you have the slightly sweeter style, it's more like exotic spicy foods like Asian curries and stuff like that. Um, and it really has a, a cult following. So um, there's still a lot of meh or sort of bleh Rieslings out there. But if you're in New York City, you have to go to that restaurant called Terroirs. It's downtown on Harrison Street. And there's Paul Greco, one of the most beloved sommeliers in the world. He is also one of the craziest, so I love him. Uh, but he has a very famous wine list that's a Bible for Riesling worshipers. And if you like music, you have to get him to pair Riesling with your favorite music types. So lastly, as, a, as an actor, uh, we had a bit of debate about this. I ended up going with Goldie Hawn. That's because for me, she has that kind of sweet, welcoming, sort of approachable style. She's very smiley, but she has a surprising dimension to her, right? With time, she's really aged well, right? She has staying power. She's won an Academy Award. She's been a, a very active mother or spouse. You know, she really is part of that Hollywood royalty. And so I think royal, Riesling surprises, but it's sort of vim and vigor. And uh, I thought she was a nice... Um, a nice comparison for, for Rieslings. Great, thank you. Now we'll move on to Sauvignon Blanc and Amy. Okay, um, so for Sauvignon Blanc, I'm gonna ask all of you to call to mind Pierce Brosnan as James Bond. Imagine him arriving in his speedboat and his linen shirt on the French Riviera. Um, Sauvignon Blanc is a crisp, bright, herbaceous wine that really wakes up the palate. Um, so a little bit of background, um, Sauvignon Blanc is thought to come from the word, the French word sauvage um, for its wild native grapevines. Um, it originates in the, in the Loire Valley um, and in Bordeaux, um, but it's pretty much grown all over the world right now. Uh, most notably in the New World, in New Zealand, and in California. Um, you might have heard of uh, Sauvignon Blanc under a couple of different names. For example, Sancerre is a uh, wine made just from Sauvignon Blanc grapes from the Loire Valley Appalachian of Sancerre. You might have also heard the term Fumé Blanc. This is purely a marketing term uh, that Robert Mondavi came up with to um, label California grown Sauvignon Blanc. Um, and Sauvignon Blanc is also a component of the famous dessert wine Sauternes. Um, I'm going to speak a little bit about the winemaking process that uh, we, we go with uh, at Nine Sons. So um, our Sauvignon Blanc is aged in concrete eggs uh, from France. So it's, a, it's a vessel shaped like an egg. And there are a couple of reasons that we use concrete. The first is that unlike stainless steel, um, in the aging process, the, the porousness of the concrete allows some oxygenation and you're going to get some evaporation. And then the other is that concrete does not impart any additional flavors uh, to the wine in a way that an oak barrel would. Um, we bottle our Sauvignon Blanc when it's, the wine is still very fresh and youthful. Um, so for example, our 2019 vintage was harvested October of last year. We just bottled it a few weeks ago in June, um, and we'll keep that in bottle, but release it for drinking in our tasting room towards the end of summer. 
Um, in terms of aromatics, so you'll hear Sauvignon Blanc be described as having a nose of that's herbaceous, stone fruit, tropical fruits, and in some cases, um, it could be described as cat pee. Um, that's uh, due to a chemical compound. Um, and speaking of chemical compounds, Sauvignon Blanc is different from all other uh, white grapes because of the presence of this aromatic compound called a pyrazine. And the pyrazines are really what give um, Sauvignon Blanc that those herbaceous flavors like jalapeno, um, definitely bell pepper, gooseberry, grass. Um, in terms of flavors, you sort of have a spectrum. So on the lighter end, it could start sort of be more like lime, and then you can move into green apple, passion fruit, and sort of ending on more like a stone fruit, like a, like a white peach. Um, in terms of food pairings, um, as I mentioned, you know, Sauvignon Blanc can just really wake up the palate. So I really recommend drinking it on its own as an aperitif, you know, to sort of get ready to eat. Um, and then its herbaceous flavors really pair well with other green herbs, like parsley, rosemary, um, basil, cilantro, and mint. Great, thank you. And um, Greg and Chardonnay. All right, uh, Chardonnay, okay, so uh, I was asked to pick an actor and this wasn't easy because uh, Chardonnay is perhaps one of the most diverse grape varietals in the world. Um, uh, so I kind of went with uh, actor, rapper, comedian Will Smith because this guy's multi-dimensional. He's got a broad range of skills and uh, he's so effing popular you kind of hate him, but you will go watch whatever he's in because it's so good. Um, uh, Chardonnay is, uh, it's the world's most popular grape. So it's planted in almost every region in, in the world um, for a couple reasons. One is that it is very reflective of terroir. So where you plant it, it kind of tends to reflect the soil, the, the temperature, the region uh, very well. And it's really easy to grow. So it'll take to a lot of different climates and different soil types. Um, uh, but that also gives it this, this amazing spectrum of flavors and styles and interpretations um, that makes it really hard to pin down as one thing. So I think, you know, when people ask me, how do I pick a good Chardonnay? It really comes down to what are you looking for in a wine? I mean, it can be, it can, it may not smell like petrolly like Goldie Hawn, but it can be as, uh, you know, sweet as Riesling, or it can be as, uh, racy as, and acidic as Sauvignon Blanc. Um, I think uh, the, the ironic thing is that it's so popular there's become a bit of a um, bit of a movement called ABC which is anything but Chardonnay because it's just become so popular it's just overwhelming to people. Um, at the same time it's absolutely my first love. Um, the first wine that I think everybody in the wine industry has that one, has, has that handful of wines that they tasted it and experienced it. And that's the reason they can't get out of the wine business is because it just hooked them. Uh, mine was probably Corton Charlemagne um, back in the early nineties. And I couldn't believe what wine could be until I tasted that wine. Um, it is a white Burgundy and white Burgundies are some of the most revered wines in the world. And so, um, I think Chardonnay has gotten a bad rap because, mainly because us Californians messed it up. Um, back in the 80s and 90s, we decided that uh, not only could we grow Chardonnay everywhere, but we could oak the hell out of it and uh, make it taste any way we wanted to. So um, because it's a very impressionable grape, uh, a little bit of oak and a little bit of malolactic goes a long way. And so we started uh, as, as, a, as a wine growing area state we started developing in that in those early years a um, a style of Chardonnay that has kind of driven the the uh, the backlash, if you will. It's uh, uh, heavy in oak, heavy in malolactic, so it's very buttery and vanilla, um, and uh, nothing like a little bit of sugar to add into there. Um, you know, so you pick it very late and very ripe, um, and it just becomes this butter bomb that I think people. Um, have reacted poorly to, although um, I personally made a, a brand of Chardonnay called Bread and Butter, ironically, and could not keep it in stock. I mean, it's still the style that everybody wants. So 
Um, it has gotten all kinds of nicknames. It's cougar juice. It's uh, uh, crack. It's uh, everything. But um, I guess I'm, I want to make a case for it because it is also one of the most beautiful bridles that you could possibly make. Um, and when done well and with care, um, uh, we here in, in Monterey are very lucky where we have a very cool climate. Um, and so we tend to get um, grapes that are, uh, you know, tend towards citrus and minerality. Um, when grown in a warmer climate or, or harvested later, it tends to go more apple and, and tropical and lose its acidity. So um, how do you pick a good Chardonnay? I, I, I think it's uh, not to promote wine drinking, but you got to try Chardonnays and see what you like. And um, the great thing is that you can taste a hundred Chardonnays and they could all be very, very different. And you'll, I guarantee you, you'll find some that you like um, in there. And depending on the style that you pick, it really goes with a host of different kinds of food. So you pick an acidic, lighter style, less oaked wine, and it's going to go better with, uh, you know, lighter foods, um, shellfish and things like that versus uh, a rich, heavy, uh, heavily oaked, rich wine that will go with uh, grilled meats and, and uh, white sauces right. and things like that. So that's Chardonnay, the Will Smith Wonderful. of Thank you. So now um, I'm, this is called time discipline. You have 30 seconds. Um, and what I'd like is another white varietal that you really enjoy. Why and one great food pairing with it. So Nicole, you're first. Well, I'm going with the uh, Viognier. I um, love the, the, the Viognier that is from the Northern Rhone, but some of you may have had uh, the Viognier. It's one of the most divisive wine grape, grape types in the world, right? It's the most loved and hated because it's so aromatic, right? That's the famous thing about Viognier, very intense aromatics and uh, sort of the Marmite of the wine world. So there were only eight hectares left in their spiritual home of the village of Condrio in the Northern Rhone. And then there was one producer who brought it back to life and now it's on five continents. So it's just beautiful, great fatty texture, beautiful floral notes. Uh, but I really recommend going with the cooler climate Viognier's. Food pairing? Um, trout, shrimp, uh, scallops, white meats, goat cheese, famously, asparagus. Okay, Amy. Okay, so like Greg, I'm also really partial to uh, white burgundy Chardonnay. Um, but my go-to while dining out, um, really because it has excellent value, um, it also has great acidity, um, which makes it versatile with a lot of foods, um, as well as like very refreshing, um, is, is Vermentino. So um, you can also, if, if, if it's sourced from a vineyard that is located by the sea in Sicily or Corsica, the wine can actually take on a little bit of saltiness as well. Um, so, so as I mentioned, you know, it's very versatile. It's really great with any kind of shellfish or, you know, cooked fish, um, anything with herbs and also citrus. Great. Greg. Okay, my white wine is Albareño. I've been drinking it all summer long. I drink it every summer. Um, and I, I love it because it is, it goes with all the food that I eat all summer long. So it goes with my salads, it goes with seafood, it goes with any kind of Mediterranean type cuisine. Um, and you drink it, you cool it down and you just drink, you can't stop drinking it. It's so delicious. Excellent. And I'm gonna go with reverse Vermina because it is completely contrary. It is um, so, so spicy and so rich. And um, it is that, and it's just so different than um, what I'm used to drinking all the time. So when I want a white and to be somewhat contrarian, that's what I go with. Uh, it is made for um, Thai food. It, um, duck breasts, the fattiness of the duck breast, and um, if I'm really feeling decadent, a black truffle omelet with uh, Gravot's demeanor. Now, we're gonna go to reds, and starting light to rich, and Greg, you're up first with Pinot Noir. Right, right, Pinot Noir, okay, so, uh, oh, this was hard. 
Where are my notes? Pinot Noir, okay. Because uh, I'm trying to remember uh, the actor I picked for Pinot Noir. Um, I didn't pick, pick an actor, did I? Oh, I was trying to think of re some really high maintenance actor and I couldn't come up with one. Probably Sean Penn, something like that. Um, uh, so I'm gonna pick Sean Penn. There you go. Okay. Uh, Pinot Noir is perhaps one of the most revered grape varietals in the world. Um, I'm going back to Burgundy now, uh, along with Chardonnay. And Pinot Noir is kind of the, the dad of Chardonnay. So Chardonnay actually is a descendant of Pinot Noir. And so uh, for that very reason, they grow in very similar climates and regions and they excel. Uh, the thing about Pinot Noir, however, is that it is super hard to grow. Um, uh, it is um, kind of uh, the original like geek out wine because because it is so representative of the terroir that it's grown in. And so people get really into like Pinot grown in what region and what side of the river and what side of the hill, because it all, those slight variations will have a huge impact on the Pinot Noir grape. Um, it is also notoriously low yield. So growing Pinot Noir can be expensive because you're not getting the kind of tonnage per acre that you would on Chardonnay or other other uh, easier to grow grapes. Um, uh, the, let's see, the, probably the most well-known thing about uh, Pinot Noir right now or in the last 15 years is Sideways. So the movie Sideways um, killed Merlot, which was the number one selling wine in America. Um, and they famously slammed Merlot as a horrible, horrible, wine to drink and and raise Pinot Noir on this pedestal. And so Merlot sales dropped and Pinot Noir sales tripled. Um, it was a crazy time. And what I would say now is, is that unfortunately, a lot of people have jumped on that bandwagon and the popular, popularity of Pinot Noir has forced it to be grown in places that may not be as well suited. Um, so before you had a lot of really bad Merlot because it was so popular, now you've got a, real, a lot of really bad Pinot Noir. So um, finding a, a really good bottle of Pinot Noir at a good price is, uh, that's like finding your Picasso at the Goodwill store. You really got to hunt, you really got to search. Um, I have Reddits out there. Um, we don't make it because <laughs> it's too damn expensive. So if you're not, if you're finding a really good Pinot Noir at a, at a good price, buy as much as you can. It goes with all kinds of different foods. It's light, it um, uh, tends to be ideally lower alcohol. Um, uh, I would say that here in the United States and in other uh, popular Pinot Noir regions, unfortunately it's been blended a lot. So you tend not to get 100% Pinot Noir, but we kind of have a joke that America's favorite wine is Syrah, but they call it Pinot Noir. So um, it's a, uh, you know, uh, I think it's something that as you, as you drink more Pinot Noirs and really get, educate yourself on that varietal, um, I, I promise you, you'll fall in love with it. Um, and uh, it will be something that really uh, expresses terroir, which is perhaps the most important thing um, and the most fun thing about uh, a bottle of wine is that it transports you to the place it was grown and the place it was made. And I think Pinot Noir does that better than anything. Great, thank you. Amy, Cabernet Sauvignon. Cabernet Sauvignon. Okay, so I wanna take you all back to James Bond, um, but this time think about Sean Connery or for some of our newer fans, Daniel Craig. Um, Cabernet Sauvignon is robust, it's full bodied, it has a real depth of flavor. Um, and it's loved for its age worthiness. Um, a little fun fact, Cabernet Sauvignon is the love child of Sauvignon Blanc, the white grape I just spoke about, and Cabernet Franc. Um, it's from Bordeaux and it tends to be blended with other Bordeaux varietals like Merlot and Cabernet Franc, um, which is what we do at Nine Cents. Um, you might've also heard of the, uh, the wine called a Super Tuscan. That's the Sangiovese grape blended with Cabernet Sauvignon. Um, so you can identify a great cab by four properties. The first is the depth of flavor, which I'll elaborate on in a minute. 
And then you have acidity, tannins, and alcohol. And so when you look at all of those um, being in good balance with each other, that's considered um, a cab that has good structure that will enable it to, uh, to age um, for 10 years or more. Um, so what do I mean when I talk about depth of flavor? That's sort of all of the different experiences you have as you're consuming the wine through your palate. Um, so for red wines, um, we always sort of look at either describing it as having a flavor of red fruit or um, like a black fruit or dark fruit. So Cabernet Sauvignon is a dark fruit. Um, our Nine Sons wine um, has, is sort of like a dark cherry. Um, you can also have it described as sort of having um, baking spices, or we, we call it mountain spices, again, sort of from our hillside uh, vineyard with all of the sage. Um, and then as the wine moves to your mid palate, um, the flavors become much more delicate and floral. So our Nine Sons wine, for example, has flavors that are like violet and sage. And then where you finish the flavor um, is really all of the, um, you know, so sort of everything that's added from aging it in barrel. So those flavors are like cedar, graphite, um, licorice, tobacco. Um, one thing I wanted to share, which might be a little bit unusual, um, is actually the market characteristics of Cabernet Sauvignon. I find them to be really interesting. Um, first of all, its prices are tracked and traded just like stocks um, on a site called the Livex. Um, also, um, Cabernet Sauvignon tends to be about 20% more expensive in bottle um, as compared to Pinot Noir. Um, and it's really interesting to, to look at the supply and demand of this. The demand side makes sense. Um, it is the most uh, prolifically grown varietal in the world. It's also the most popular red wine to drink in the world. Um, on the supply side, you know, as Greg just explained, it's really hard to grow Pinot Noir. It's, it's you know, fickle harvests. Um, but one of the reasons they think Cab is still more expensive is because, because it's grown all over the world, um, you know, houses are able to have a consistent supply and also make a really consistent style. That's really great for an end user. Um, I mentioned that Cab age as well. So time will lower a wine's acidity and tannins. And, you know, that's a really good thing. That's going to lead to much more delicate flavors that are like stewed or dried fruits. Um, however, it takes a lot of space in your cellar and um, sort of a lot of money to age wine. So for example, example at Nine Sons, um, we won't bring our bottled wine to market until three years after harvest. So we're kind of sitting on all of that inventory. Um, in terms of food pairings, um, the tannins that are in Cabernet Sauvignon act as scrapers of fat and you know, proteins that sort of accumulate on your tongue when you're eating. So you wanna go towards foods that are like high in fat and protein. So of course it's gonna be like prime rib, you know, ribeye, New York State strip, uh, filet mignon, or like a rack of lamb. Great. And then finally, the richest of the red varietals we're discussing, uh, Syrah or Shiraz as it's called down under, Nicole. So, you know, we're talking about noble grapes, and for me, Syrah, Shiraz, is, is, is actually regal, because it's a natural leader. It's very much a grape of our time as well, though, because it's sort of gender non-binary, is that what they say? Uh, what I mean by that is that Cab is always cast as the alpha male, whereas Syrah can play the, the, the king or the queen, so a cooler climate Sierra is typically considered the noblest and the ones from the Northern Rhone are usually the most expensive and the most prestigious, but um, you know, many people refer to Sierra from the Northern Rhone as like the queen of, of the Northern Rhone. And I guess Sierra likes to rule, right? So it's not always a good team player, especially with other alpha grapes, but it does tend to get along very well with Grenache, the king of the Southern Rhone, because Grenache is the quintessential team player grape and it sort of graciously defers to the Sierra. And she brings the discipline and the tannic structure and that gravitas. And um, the Grenache is the more sort of friendly, easygoing companion that sort of molds itself to the Sierra. Um, so typically associated with dark fruits like uh, blueberries or blackberries, plums. Um, and then 
the famous violet smell. So again, dead giveaway. If you smell violets in a red wine or black Sichuan pepper, probably a Syrah. Uh, so in warmer climates, like the south of France or Australia, hotter parts of California, typically uh, it's, it's bigger, beefier, more concentrated. And some would argue that it, sometimes it has a bit less elegance. So of course there are many notable exceptions but it's also less serious, less intimidating, a bit more yummy. Um, and the cliche, of course, is that um, the ubiquitous you know, Australian Shiraz from the 80s, okay? So Shiraz and Syrah are supposed to be the same grape, but typically when you're speaking, if you say Shiraz, you're referring often to that, 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 you know, bigger, denser, sort of oaky, fruit balmy thing that, that was very popular back then and almost cost Syrah its, its sort of noble credentials. Whereas if you say Syrah, it's more the, the kind of more elegant implication. So, I mean, I think they both have their place in the culture. I mean, uh, sometimes if you think about sort of an over the top ice cream sundae with all the trappings and the whipped cream and all that, you know, it might be poo-pooed in a fancy restaurant, but it still has its place in, in pop culture as an icon, a bit like we were saying about the, the very buttery uh, Chardonnays. There's still a lot of demand for it. Uh, luckily for the people who love wine, um, you can find beautiful, less extracted uh, Syrahs everywhere now, starting with Australia, uh, cooler microclimates hot re of hot regions like, you know, Santa Barbara, for example, and the mountain fruit from the hills in Napa, or even the southern Rhone where we are up in the mountains. Uh, for me, that's kind of best of, of several worlds. With food, I'm always thinking about lamb. So you think Syrah, you think lamb. Uh, lamb, Syrah, right? W warmer climates, bacon, braised beef, uh, cooler climates, I like to say Syrah likes feathers, duck, goose, turkey, all of those uh, things that fly great with Thanksgiving, turkey, uh, eggplant. If you're a vegetarian, great combination for eggplant. So I'd say that as an actor, I would put it as a character actor like Cabernet. So for me, it's very easily recognizable. Their identity is always kind of holding its own. So I cast it at Jack Nicholson because no matter what role he's playing, he always keeps that persona. He brings that forceful presence, the bagfuls of character, but he also always has the little naughty twinkle in his eye. And for me, in the case of Sira, that's that telltale spice that's gonna give you that clue that it's, that it's probably uh, a Sira. Wonderful. All right, so again, this is real quick. Uh, your other favorite red varietal that we didn't do a deep dive in. Greg, you're up. Uh, I'm making my case for Merlot. Uh, it is going to make a comeback, I swear to you. Um, and um, I would say that if you're looking at a wine list, the high-end Merlots are the best values you could possibly find because nobody would drink it anymore. So buy a Merlot. I'm going to make t-shirts. Amy? Okay, um, so tonight I sort of spoke about a family of grapes um, that had um, this compound of pyrazines. So the other parent of Cabernet Sauvignon is Cabernet Franc. Um, and this red, uh, red wine um, goes on that red fruit, side, more like strawberry and raspberry flavors. And then it gets really balanced out with herbs and this peppery earthiness that all comes from the pyrazines compounds. Um, so I don't have like a food pairing for this one, but I really wanted to call attention to an unusual wine growing region. Um, there's some great old vineyards that are planted back to like 19th century California gold rush in the Sierra Nevada foothills. And you can find Cabernet Franc there. You can also find a lot of independent winemakers who are doing biodynamic wine and even vegan wines. So, you know, check those out. Thank you. Nicole. So we were all fighting over who got to present Grenache. So I'm, I'm very excited I did. I'm a hardcore Grenachista, even created the International Grenache Association and all that. So it's the ultimate underdog grape, sort of the unsung hero of the wine world because it's actually most, one of the most widely planted red grapes in the world. And 
consumers don't even know that because it's usually blended. It's such a good team player that everybody uses it to bring that velvety, voluptuous mouthfeel to the wines. It's got that umami yumminess. And so uh, you, because winemakers like it so much, I mean, blending without Grenache is like cooking without butter. So it's no surprise that most rosés are made with a Grenache base. And it's the ultimate Mediterranean grape. It grows where olives grow. Uh, it grows great with that kind of food. It usually, a taste of red fruit can be soft and cheerful, gentle, or it can even be dark, complex brooding. And it has that uh, real ability to reflect the terroir. It's the ultimate method actor, like Daniel Day-Lewis, like totally morphing into the character and allowing you to travel through wine. And that's typically the next stage in a wine journey is once you move away from the safe stuff that you're excited about because you can easily recognize it into the, you know, the, the grapes that, that allow you to taste all this diversity of places. Great. Um, and I'm going with uh, what I call the Grand Dame of Italy, Neviolo. Um, it is age-worthy. It's lovely if you are into uh, delayed gratification. Um, I think that Neviolo is, uh, the, is that's the key. Um, food pairings, uh, also buco, short ribs, um, and my personal favorite, um, a homemade sausage and uh, mushroom pizza from Pepe's uh, is mm -hmm. for Neviolo. Now, we've actually spent an awful lot of time and um, I'm trying to be mindful of getting to some Q&A. Um, so a couple of things that we're going to do here. First, uh, we, we're going to do some more of these. And so I'm going to ask someone to put a poll up. And you can let us know um, which of the following topics in the poll may be of interest to you uh, so that when we plan to do some others, um, and panelists, you aren't allowed to vote. Actually, ours is disabled. We couldn't vote. Sustainability, if we... sustainability. <laughs> um, but um, I want to um, be mindful of time. But one of the questions that I'm going to ask each of you just really, really quickly to speak to this. Um, one of the questions that we got more than any, the, one of the common themes was around diversity in the wine industry. And uh, knowing that that was in part um, the reasons that we chose not to do this on the, on the original date um, prompted a lot of conversations. So um, Amy, uh, any observation, quick observation you want to make? Well, Bloomberg just published an article that stated that only one tenth of one percent of U.S. winemakers and brand owners are black. Um, and I think we have to look at the history of the United States and slavery um, and recognize that the enslaved were not permitted to own land. Um, and then you add on to that U.S. policies that have produced extreme economic disparity between black and white Americans. And, you know, the reality is the wine business is a luxury business and it's really capital intensive. I also think that the gatekeepers of our industry, you know, are white and exclusionary. So for me, it's really our individual responsibility to seek out um, black wine professionals, you know, they exist, and really unpack why it is that we don't see them with, you know, expertise, knowledge, and authority in wine. Um, you can look to the Association of African American Vintners, um, or, and there's a newly formed black wine professionals group who are all promoting awareness. Um, but I think ultimately, we have to follow the calls to action of the Movement for Black Lives to make systemic change. Great, thank you. Nicole? Well, here in the south of France in the backwaters of the Vaucluse, it's not a very diverse region by any stretch of the imagination. And certainly even white female winemakers were not exactly welcome with open arms. And yet, I guess because we have that opportunity to create a little enclave here of best practices, from the get-go, we've had an incredibly diverse team. Uh, one of my mo most longest standing colleagues is a, is a black woman. We have every race, nationality, uh, ethnic, uh, and, uh, and you know, religious uh, and, and gender persuasion here. So um, I think, uh, I think that uh, the best thing in an area like this sometimes is to just lead by example. 
Thank you, Greg. Um, obviously, judging by this panel, the Asians are taking over. So that's that's what's really happening. Um, uh, I gave this some thought, and I I kind of looked back at 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 thinking about how Amy and I were representing wineries on this panel. Um, I would say that there's something something to the culture of wine that is not, you know, I'll say as a Korean American growing up uh, with parents that were Korean immigrants, they never had wine. They never had wine in the house. They never talked about wine. Uh, they drink a lot of it now because they get free, get it free. But, uh, you know, I, I think it's just not, I think it has to be part of the culture in order for it to be um, something that in today's world, especially in the American wine industry is more representative. I mean, it's, there were too many Italians. Well, no, it's not. It's because it was part of their culture and they brought it to the United States. I don't think, um, uh, um, you know, so I, I think that that's a big part of it is that as, uh, as a second generation American, wine is a different part of my life than it was for my grandparents. And so it made sense for me to be in the wine industry versus my parents or their, their parents. So, I, th I think there's just something to the history of it that is not necessarily, um, uh, not to say that there isn't some exclusionary uh, point to it, but I think culturally it, it has not historically been part of um, a lot of cultures. I mean, we have a lot of um, people of uh, Latino X community that work with us, they don't even drink wine. So, you know, there, there, there's a little bit of culture to it, I think that, that needs to be inserted into that conversation. And I'll just add that one of the goals of CAA, when the Wine Industry Network, is to make wine accessible to everyone. And I think that from a consumer level, um, trying to demystify it and, should, and, and really open up um, dialogue between people who have an interest. Uh, I will tell you the uh, one of our newest winemakers uh, who we uh, came in contact with, Columbia Winemakers, is a GSAS alumna named Marvina um, Robinson. And she is the only uh, African-American owner of a champagne house called Stuyvesant. So uh, I'm giving a plug for Marvina and she actually makes champagne popsicles as well. So um, <clears throat> it's just something to keep in mind. We are starting to run out of time. Um, so I've got a couple of questions and I wanna save time because we have a special treat for all of you at the end. So um, one of the questions that I've gotten is, what is your favorite part of the wine world? So um, I'm going to, uh, this is gonna, let me just say, we will respond to all of your questions. I promise you in the next couple of days, you will receive a response to your questions. Um, Nicole, the thing you love most about the wine world. I think that it's a, it's, it's kind of a kinder, gentler world. I mean, I came from finance and think tanks, but I, I love the people, you know, people want to make wine because making wine is so much fun. Selling it is totally not fun, but Hey, uh, but, uh, but I think the biggest surprise for me is to this, incredibly supportive, enjoyable community, this mixture of artists and business people and everybody's kind of unique and very passionate about what they do. So that's a, a very big bonus of working in this world. Uh, Greg? Uh, probably the thing I like most is that it's kind of an endless well of learning. Um, I'll never know enough about wine and no one will ever learn everything about wine. It's as ancient as it is. It's just, I, I, I can't even keep up with Pinot Noir clones lately. So it's, uh, um, you know, I, I, and I find that exciting. Okay. Um, I think wine can be written off um, as really inaccessible and this luxury product. Um, you need knowledge and access and, and money to have it. Um, but I also view it as an industry that touches many areas of social significance and, you know, have, has potential impact in the world. You know, it's farming, manufacturing, climate change, um, international trade, immigration and labor, 
states' rights versus federal rights when it comes to prohibition laws that still govern how we sell wine in the United States. You know, it's family business, which I work in. Uh, you, you get my get the point. Um, and so for me, it's really a professional way. It's a way for me to professionally engage, you know, all of my values with intention and also while drinking. Yes. Okay. Um, and I'll just add, it's just getting to know people like you. Um, it has been um, so much fun and it is a journey that never ends. Um, for those of, for our audience, I want you all to know that there are some, um, there's a code going around um, for um, savings from um, Greg as well as Nicole. And um, also, um, if you want to get on to um, Nine Sons um, mailing list, all of that has come. The other thing that we will be sending to all of you is our gift. It is a noble grape cheat sheet. So it has a little description of all of the noble grapes, um, where they're, a little description, where their major areas of growth are, and then other wines, other varietals that you'll like if you like those. Um, um, and people are sending questions. I promise you I will respond to all these questions or farm them out. Um, but before we go, um, we will do the follow-up. We'll send you the cheat sheet. Um, I highly recommend taking it with you, um, or put, taking a photo and putting it on your phone uh, so you always know exactly what to do. Um, but we want to toast you, so we each have a little something uh, with us. And Nicole, what will you be toasting with? I have my Syrah blend. It's called Eloise. It's Syrah with some Grenache and a little splash of a white wine called Roussan. And it's the yin and yang of Abelard, of Abelard and Eloise, the famous French lovers. So I'm going to be toasting to you with Eloise. Okay, and Amy? Um, so I wanted to share another Asian winemaker tonight. Um, I'm drinking a white Burgundy pop quiz. That's Chardonnay. Um, this is made by a Korean female winemaker named J. Chu. Um, her label, see, I've got the bottle here too, is called Maison de Jean, and she's actually working now in the Rhone. So find her. Uh, I am I'm drinking a folktale wine. It is a our uh, Sangiovese Nouveau, and our Nouveau we bottle just after harvest, kind of a homage to uh, Beaujol Beaujolais Nouveau. And so we drink it. It's not an ageable wine. We pop it. We drink it. It's light and chilled and delicious. And uh, I'm going to finish this bottle. And I am going to toast with. I, I can't play favorites, so I'm going with a. Uh, 2010 Cune Grand Reserva, uh, made by a business school alum, Victor Diarita, in Rioja. And so we toast all of you good health and safety in this time and look forward to doing this again with you very soon. And we thank you very, very much. Um, I want to end by telling you that next week, we will be doing a, a special program for families uh, called the Antarctic Ice Sheet, Past, Present, and Future. And that will feature Assistant Professor Johnny Kingslake from the Lamont Doherty uh, Earth Observatory. And um, it is uh, going to be at a special time, 5 p.m. And it is particularly designed for uh, families with children between the ages of 10 and 15. So look for that. So we toast you and uh, wish you a good morning, good evening, or good afternoon, wherever you are in the world. Thanks for tuning in with us. Thank you, Ken. You've been an absolute superstar putting this together. And it's been an absolute pleasure getting to know you and your team and my my fellow winemakers, I can't wait to visit them and have you all visit me. Thank you, everyone.